Good morning. Try to keep the announcements quick so we can get into the message. But the 23rd, we are having a great time here. We're having an Easter egg hunt. We're having brunch. We're having breakfast. Bring your little ones. We passed out little uh, cards with gifts. We're getting great uh, responses from that. By the way, we do ask, if possible, that if they have an Easter basket, they bring it. If they don't, we have baskets here as well, but bring it if you can. And that way you'll have plenty of candy to go home with, right? You have a way to have it all collected. Come, come spend Easter with us. Come have breakfast with us. And I want to let you know now is the time to invite people. We've got some fun messages coming up. I think they're fun. We've got some really good messages coming up. Um, next week, we're going to talk about Judas, the inside-outside guy. The week after that, we're talking about Barabbas and how Jesus literally died on his cross and mine and yours. We're looking at that. And then he is risen. Right, church? Now's the time. I said he is risen. (laughs) I'm used to people shouting back, he is risen indeed, but close enough. Close enough. <laughs> We're really, it's a great time to be here and be a part of New Hope. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew. We're going to be in uh, chap- chapter 27, where we will be today. So if you've been with us in our Easter study, we've been looking at different individuals, and we're going to continue with that as we look next week at Judas, and then at Barabbas, and then at Christ and the the Father and the resurrection. Fun series, fun time to be here. If you began with this, you know that we talked about Jesus and his time with the religious rulers and on trial with them and how how there were so many reasons why they could not do what they did and they broke every law they possibly could think of trying to get them. And then when they finally had them on a made up charge, they switched it when they went to Caesar. I mean, when they went to Pilate and lied about that and then we talked about Pilate and how he was twice before Pilate once with Herod and how Pilate was actually pretty interested in doing the right thing but only to a certain level because what he cared more about that was his reputation and his prominence and his his wanting to get along to go along and then how Herod Herod just wanted to be entertained just show me some miracles while you're here and how none of these guys found any actual wrong with them, but they didn't care. What they wanted above all else was not to rack the status quo, which is the same thing the religious rulers wanted. They wanted to quiet this guy down because they wanted to be powerful. They wanted to be wealthy. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted it to be all about me. And even having the Messiah here could mess that up. And so they wanted him dead. So as we're talking about people... And I was preparing the message. I thought, what about the disciples? Oh, we know where they were. They were hiding in fear, right? And I can't be too hard on them. They were afraid they were going to be next. And I could see that as well. I could see being pretty terrified of what's going on right now. They arrested Jesus. They arrested their Messiah. And now they're taking him to trial. That would be a scary, scary thing. And then we come to who we're talking about today. The people. We're talking about the people during the trials of Jesus. And now, I am convinced that really there is no greater power than what belongs to the people. Maybe it's because I grew up in the United States. But I really believe that for the most part, there's no greater power than that which belongs to the people. I don't think there is an army in the world, even ours, our super strong army, that could stop 300 million citizens deciding that, you know what, we're going to call today Thursday from now on. Or, you know what, none of us are going to pay taxes ever again. What could you do against 300 million on that? You can't because the power to rule really belongs on people being willing to be ruled. So thus they punish an outsider who would go against that. I think it's the voice of the people that is the most profoundly powerful thing in society. And it's the willingness of the people to be governed that allows others to govern. But here's the problem. 
It is the most powerful thing, yes, but it's also the most fickle thing. There's nothing quite as fickle as a group of people can be sometimes. So there's a movie that I really enjoyed in the 90s, Men in Black. It's this really goofy, goofy alien movie. But there's this great line in it where, where the, the young officer who just learned about aliens kind of makes the comment, why don't we tell people? People are smart. And the longtime alien person says, a person is smart. But people People, when they're together, they're what? They're dumb, dangerous, panicky group. And it's true. I hate to admit that. It's true. It's really weird to say that to a group of people. But we're all people. In reality, a crowd gets fickle. This crowd, they turned on Jesus, right? This crowd got fickle, and they turned on Jesus. And we will see that. If you will read with me. Beginning in verse 15 of chapter 27. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. And at that time, they were holding a, a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ. For he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with this righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want released to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and our children. And then he released Barabbas to them, or for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. What a fickle, fickle group of people. So why? Why did this happen? As we read this passage, as we look at other Gospels, why did this happen? What were the events? What are the things in a moment I'm going to want you to write down? What were the things that led to this, to the crowd shouting, crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas? First, they listened to liars. Again, the first thing that happens when, when a crowd can turn is they listen to liars. They listen to them. There were wicked instigators moving amongst the ranks of the people. The people were there. The people were there to see the, the court case, if you will. The people were familiar with Barabbas. The people were very familiar with Jesus, and they were there. And yet there were little instigators moving back and forth amongst the crowd, whispering in their ear and firing them up. Mark 15 tells us, But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? What should I do? What should I do? You know, I've seen this in my life. I have seen this in my life, and I've seen people who go along with the crowd. Everyone says, this guy is really, really bad. This guy is terrible. This guy is evil. This guy wants to harm the world. If you'll just turn on any news station, there's a station talking about one leader. This guy is nothing, nothing but evil, 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 evil. And then you flip to another channel, and they're like, no, no, this guy's great. This guy is the evil guy. 
this guy is the bad guy. He's the, the horrible one. It's always one group and another group, and they're stirring each other up. He's either super, super good or he's super, super bad. And I have gone into election seasons. I hate to get political for a moment, but I'm going to. I've gone into election seasons and I've wondered how that person with that sticker opposite of my sticker, how can they be so stirred up, so wrong, so completely confused about every single thing that they would vote for that guy? And then to my astonishment, they look at me in the same way. And I'm like, but I'm right and you're wrong. That's the clear answer, right? I know it all. You must know nothing. We have these arguments. We get that kind of stirred up. The crowd was caught up in emotion because there were people working amongst them saying, don't look at Jesus. Look to Barabbas. Don't look to Jesus. Look to what you most want. And what is it you most want? What is it most of us want? Comfort, right? We want our pain to go away. We want our struggle to be removed. I want to take you back, way back 2,000 years, to a group of people who for hundreds of years had been imprisoned, in essence. They'd been occupied, and really for thousand years before that, a different occupier, a different occupier, a different occupier. The one thing the Jews really had in common is the ability to not rule themselves. They continually had somebody with their thumb on them holding them down. How long would it take you to be sick of that? I've got about 14 minutes of that, and then I'm ready to fight, right? It doesn't take long, and they generation to generation to generation to generation of imprisonment, of someone holding them down, somebody ruling them, and now they've got these Romans living amongst them who are just taxing them to death. You made $11, I want eight of it. Bring it to me and I will make up the reason the tax is for. This is for some new made-up tax. I see that you went fishing and you brought 11 fish you caught. I'm going to want three of those fish. Even though you went and did the work and you were going to feed your family, you know what, your family can eat, but maybe not on so much stuff. This is what they were dealing with. Oh, and I might just kill you tomorrow. No reason whatsoever we may just kill granddad in the yard because he looked at somebody wrong. That is what they were dealing with, and they were sick of it. And so they were hoping for quick, easy change. They're easy to be stirred up, a group that's easy to get behind just about anything. And they listened to the liars. They listened to those stirring them up, firing them up, getting them excited. Jesus is going to bring harm to us all. Jesus didn't do the things you hoped he would do. He didn't come in and just bring an army and defeat the Romans this morning. He didn't do all these big hopeful things things he's going to bring harm to us but more than that they wanted to stay in power so they excited the crowd who listened to liars number one number two the second failure of this crowd is they were committed only to carnival that's it they were committed to carnival They listened to liars, and they were committed to carnival. What does that mean? They wanted a show. They wanted a show. They wanted the what can you do for me today. That's all they cared about. If you wouldn't mind flipping over six chapters to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, we're going to begin in 1. I'll give you a moment to get there. Beginning in 21, verse 1. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. 
untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle, and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. What an event. Like, wow, right? I mean, what an event. Can you imagine? I, th- I know you've actually probably seen it. If you've been to many church plays, you've seen that moment where they have the palm branches and they're waving them and they're setting them in the ground, throwing them around. I mean, they're putting blankets. This is such an exciting event. And what this moment was, was also political. This moment was the invitation, if you will, of the king. Like we are having the king come in. He is coming in in all royalty. He is going to rule the day. This is the political button. This is the moment. Here comes the king. Can you imagine how excited they must have been? Have you watched these events like in England? You've seen on the news how the crowds, everybody just gets together. This big thing with the king or the queen is happening. And it's super exciting. I don't know that we have events like that anymore. But where it's this absolute moment of hope. Things are about to change. Maybe as he comes in, we're going to have, and let's just talk about what happened, or maybe, just maybe, we're going to have mass worldwide repentance and sacrifices. Maybe Caesar's going to send an envoy, and the envoy's going to come and apologize for everything we did, and here's a bunch of gold to you to set up your kingdom in Jerusalem. Maybe Jesus would go into the temple and set up a throne in the Holy of Holies, and we will go and worship Him, maybe, maybe instead He's going to return to sitting on the throne of David and we're going to punish the Romans and punish the Persians and punish the Babylonians. We're going to punish all these people, maybe. Maybe on Holy Sabbath days, all the world will come to Jerusalem. The Gentiles will come and pay homage for all the years that they didn't celebrate our festivals. Maybe all the Jews will be able to come and and sacrifice. And maybe, just maybe, we will have the authority. That's not how it went, though, is it? Is that what you guys remember? If we flip over a page or two in the Gospels, do we see that? No. I will tell you, one day, Jesus will set up in Jerusalem as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And one day, His rule will be one of authority and love, of grace and gratitude from those who are here. One day, one day that will happen. But today, that Sunday, or that Saturday, that day, thousands of years ago, that moment, that Palm Sunday, they were declaring Him King. They were declaring Him King. And then a few days later, they were nailing Him to the cross and celebrating it, and cheering it, and being joyous about it, without Him performing some national evil. Why? How could that happen? Because they were only committed to Jesus for what they could get out of the relationship. That's all they cared about. What can He do for me? And so I've got... 
a few reasons why some people come to Jesus. Number one, some people come to Jesus because eternal life sounds a lot better than hell. Let's just call it like it is. Some people come to Jesus because eternal life sounds a lot better than the other option. And I will grant you this is certainly true. This is certainly something that different seasons in my life Heaven sounded a whole lot better. Actually, every season of my life, heaven sounds a whole lot better. But certain times, that was the main thing I cared about. There's been times in my life where my heart was right here. As a teenager, I've been running to Jesus because I was terrified of an incredibly angry God. Anybody been there before? Has anybody been there before? I am just terrified of God who's ready to judge, ready to pounce, ready to strike me dead. I think there was even a line in a movie, Oh, spite me, thy great spider, or that mighty spider, or whatever he shouted. I think it was maybe Forrest Gump. But it was this idea that, that I am running to God because I don't want the other option. And that's a good place to start. That is a great place to start because none of us should want the other option. We'll call these people wrath fleers. And at t- different times in my life, I've been a wrath fleer. But then some other people, some other people come to Jesus not because of hell, but because of life. It's grace that gets these people. These are the people who have looked in the mirror. They've taken a hard look at themselves and they've seen their heart. They've seen their sin. They've seen their failure. They've possibly seen God's holiness and recognize how far they are. These people have actually tasted and felt shame. And they felt that sting of sorrow and of guilt. And I'm convinced that if Jesus offered nothing other than forgiveness of sin and a relationship with God right now on earth, and when you died, you went into the void of nothingness, no memory, no thought, no anything, those people would still come running because they seek grace. and They seek forgiveness. And there's been times, there's been times in my life that I've been there. I think some of us probably have, most of us, all of us in truth, at one time or another, one point or another, have seen who we really are. We've looked into that mirror and we've had something happen where we felt that shame. And then God's grace seems bigger, seems more real, seems more undeserved. That moment we're like, we don't deserve it. And that moment, I always like to say, that's the moment grace gets you. Those people are the grace seekers. Some people come to Jesus like this crowd right here. They're around Jesus because of what Jesus can do for them. I'm going to flip to John. And if you want to, flip to John as well. John chapter 6. I'm going to have you bouncing around a little bit today. I probably should have warned you. But flip to John 6. We're going to be here for a little bit. give you guys just a minute to get there. John 6, verse 60. And we'll read through 66. He had just been preaching to him, and after he'd finished this message, it begins in 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, not one or two, but many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. 
I will Danielize this. Many of his disciples recognized that they weren't going to get out of it what they wanted, and they left them because they were in this for themselves. What they wanted was what they could get from God in this scenario. I mean, this is a time where he was a celebrity in essence. How popular will I get? How much power am I going to have? Am I going to be the head of the army? Am I going to be in charge? When we go and conquer the world, am I going to sit on the cabinet? What powerful position do I get for hanging out with you? How many times do people leave the church over this reason or that reason? I put one reason, two reasons, three reasons, four. Some people will seek any reason to walk out that door. I just created a limerick for us, New Hope. So we should be proud of the little poem, but people will seek any reason whatsoever when they're in it for themselves. When they're in it for themselves. I've known so many like this. I've known so many who have left. They leave forever. They don't leave a congregation. It's not that they left New Hope and went to some other church. So many will leave faith. Because somebody said something. Somebody did something. Somebody said something to them they did not like. Sometimes what was said was wrong, but a lot of times what they said was the truth that they needed to hear. And so that person leaves the church because of it. In truth, what they really leave is the connection of looking religious because of it, because it just wasn't worth it anymore. Oftentimes, more common in my opinion, They leave because they had a need and God did not immediately answer that prayer. He didn't immediately go make it go away. He didn't immediately remove the pain, remove the sting, remove the failure. And I'll admit a lot of times our failures are what we call reaping what you sowed. And but God didn't take that away. He or the church either did not know, did not recognize, or did not have the ability or chose not to spring into action and just fix it. For them. And at that point, they leave. A lot of times we hear this. A lot of times in counseling, I have heard this. I prayed and he did not answer. I prayed for this and he did not respond. I had this coming and he did not fix it. I prayed and heard nothing. To which I often want to say and have sometimes said, Oh, I'm sorry. Were you God? Is that what happened? Were you God in this relationship? Because I thought God was God and that I was the creation. I thought He was the potter. I am the clay. He is the creator. I am the creation. He is the authority. I am submissive. He is the grace granter. I am the grace receiver. He is the forgiver. I am the sinner. I am the guilty one. He is the Savior. Some people miss it. Some people miss it. Fourth group, some people, some people do not come to Jesus at all. They just won't do it. Matthew 13 tells us a story. And in that story, Jesus is talking about a man who was sowing. He was throwing seed. You guys know the story. I'm going to give it to you a little bit backwards, but basically the story, he throws some on good soil, right? Good soil, and it just grows up. Like it it landed on people who at the right time, right need, being called by God, absolutely needed the story, needed the truth. And when it got a hold of them, they couldn't let go of it. They clung to Jesus to everything they had because they saw themselves. And they saw Him, and they saw the gap and the void, and that root went deep. I would call these people disciples. Not just these disciples, I would call these people disciples. 2,000 years ago, He is still making disciples, amen? I would call these people disciples. But some of the seeds, it got thrown on thorny ground. Thorny ground. And so the thorny ground, that's the people who had problems in life come up. They were the people who who didn't get exactly what they wanted right then. They were also the people like Pilate who looked at the story, looked at the truth, was interested, even engaged and asked, what is truth? 
He was wanting to know some answers, but then he looked around at the crowd and said, Oh, I don't want people thinking about me this way. Am I a Jew? I certainly am not. I don't want people thinking something different about me. And so he let it choke him out. Let the truth just choke him out. Let the truth be choked out. But then some of the seeds landed on rocky soil. They had no root at all. They jumped in quick. I am going to church. I am a Christian. Yay! But then next Sunday, I am sleeping in because that was a little embarrassing. I don't want to do that again. Right, these people had no root. It did not take root. It was an emotional, fun experience. And they ran up the aisle and they may have cried and gave their life, but they didn't give anything other than that moment. And Monday morning, no, I don't want any of that. These are these wayward disciples. These people who as soon as it got real, they got going. That's the wayward disciple. Then finally, finally, some of the seeds fell on the concrete, which meant the whole time Jesus was talking, they were thinking their response instead of listening. I've been in a lot of arguments where I played this role, where the whole time they were speaking, I was just thinking about how I was going to respond, and I never heard what they were saying. No empathy was applied. No grace was applied. No intelligence from Daniel was applied because I was just thinking of what I was going to say. These are the religious leaders. These are a lot of people today. It doesn't matter if you literally hit them in the face with truth. They're not going to hear it because all they care about is their response. It never went anywhere. The third failure of this crowd Remember, number one, they listened to liars. Number two, they were committed to carnival. And then finally, three, they sought not the Savior. Number three, they sought not the Savior. I'm going to have you go back to Matthew 27, but keep your finger here in John for me. Like, don't lose John 660. But we'll go back to 27, or I can just tell you that it's just one verse. I can just read it to you if you don't want to flip back. John 27, 22. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? What shall I do with Jesus? There is no more profound question that I can find in all of Scripture. We can sit here and read all of it. You're not going to find a more profound scripture. And I would argue there's no more profound question in all of history than the question of what shall I do with Jesus? And there's no more important question for each one of us to answer right here, right now, today. What shall I do with Jesus? You see, some people, as we're going through our people, Some people, our fifth group of people, some Christians, some disciples, some sinners, some saints, some mature, some immature people come to Jesus because He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. They come to Him because He is the very great I Am, which is the name God gives for Himself. The reason I had you keep your finger in John is I want you to see that laid out. Here is the last little bit, 67 to 69. So Jesus said to the 12, his little group that didn't go away, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed And I've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. What a response. Where could I go? It is you, Jesus. I am forever with you because of who you are. So what then shall I do with Jesus? If I were to ask you that question, if I was a total non-believer and I were to ask you the question, what shall I do with Jesus? If I'm Pilate and I'm standing here beside him and I were to ask a group of believers, what should I do with this man right here, Jesus? I would hope our answer would be, well, number one, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he is Lord. So start there. 
Start by bowing to Him, confessing He is Lord. And then I've got some stuff for you to obey because Lord means He's the one in charge. He's the authority. He's the one who makes the rules. Number one, love God with all you got. Right? Love God. It says love, God with, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. What does all that mean? It means love Him with everything you got. Every single piece of you. Love God with your best. Then, then, do things because you want to serve God, not because you want to impress people. Yes, do the work. As James mentioned, you know, faith without works is dead. You'll know my faith by my works. He's not saying you can earn it, but he's saying you can do it with the right reason. Do it because you love God and you want to serve God. We're about to have in two weeks, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. We're going to be hiding those eggs because we want to serve God. And we serve God by bringing joy to those children, right? That's the thing. I want you to see that Christian people love people. And they're good people. And it's because God loves them. And I want you to feel the joy that we have. So let's go hide an egg and find the egg and laugh and engage them. Serve God. Not because you want people to be impressed, but because you want to serve God. Number three, humble yourself. Truthfully, all of these require this. Humble yourself. Number four, follow Jesus, come what may. Maybe you're healed, maybe you get sick. Maybe you get a great job, a great income, maybe you lose everything. Maybe you have four suits, maybe you barely have a shirt on your back. Maybe you're hungry, maybe you're well fed. Maybe you're out preaching and leading millions to Christ. Maybe you're in a dungeon being beaten for Jesus. Serve Jesus, come what may. Number five, pray. And then pray some more, and then keep on praying. Right? That's that other piece. Pray, and then pray some more, and then keep on praying. This one I had some fun with, number six. Don't sweat the small stuff. And don't sweat the big stuff either, right? Don't sweat the small stuff and don't sweat the big stuff either. Why? Because God's got you. God's got you. He's got you right where He wants you and He's got His hand on the future and He knows and loves you and He's got it taken care of. Which leads us to number seven. Trust God even over money. Trust God even over money. That's how we love God. But then he tells us to do something else, right? What's that other piece? This is the harder one, I think. Love others. He tells us to love others. How do we love others? Number one, you love your neighbor the same as you love yourself, which means I take care of my neighbor the same I take care of me. If I'm cutting my grass and my neighbor can't cut their grass, something happened. If I have time, maybe it's okay for me to cut their grass. If I've made a big roast and I know my neighbor is hungry today, maybe it's okay if I bring them some dinner or have them over. And there's no, no requirements on it. And there's no, I brought the news crew over so they can all see me give you this meal. Maybe, just maybe, I love my neighbor and I take care of them just like I love and take care of myself. Number two, maybe I love Christians the same way Jesus loved the disciples. That's that other piece. I'm going to love Christians the same way Jesus loved the disciples, which goes beyond how you love your neighbor, right? It's beyond that. It's harder. It's more intimate. It's more time-consuming. It's, I'd say, more exhausting. It can get to the point where sometimes, like, oh, man, the last thing I want to do is answer this phone call. Hello. Right? That's part of it. I'm going to love Christians the same way Jesus loved his disciples. And then, here's the next step of that. It's like part B of that. I'm going to love fellow believers, whether they're in my church or not. I'm going to love fellow Christians so much, so hard, so openly, that non-Christians start talking about it. Right? Because he wanted that. He wanted our love for each other to be so amazing and so public that non-believers are like, what is wrong with those people? They just met each other and 
big hug and they're laughing and talking. They're absolutely giving everything they got to take care of each other. And they don't even know each other. They don't even go to the same church. Why are the Nazarenes cutting the Baptist grass? I don't understand what's happening here. We're going to love each other so much, non-believers start talking about it. And then here's where it gets tougher. Love those that hate you. Let's go beyond the next door neighbor thing. Love those people who have it in for you. They hate you. Treat them well. Treat them with kindness. Do for them. And do for them out of the way God loves you. I forget our numbers. I think we're on five. Treat others like you want to be treated and not like you have been treated. So treat them how you want to be treated and not like they treated you. Number six, the same one came, this is dealing with God too and with others. Be humble. Be humble before God, be humble before others. I think we're at seven. Are we at seven? Let's call it seven. Number seven, pray for those that hurt you. Number seven, pray for those that hurt you. Number eight goes on, it attaches to love those that hate you. This one says, do good to those that hate you, which goes beyond emotion, but do actions. Do actions to better those who want to harm you. There's nothing more powerful or more effective in life than being kind to somebody who's mean to you. I think the Bible calls it throwing hot coals on their head. And the Bible's saying don't actually throw hot coals on their head. That, that's bad. Go the other way and be so kind that it's hard for them to continue the hate. Number nine, serve others. Serve others. Number ten, bless those that curse you. Do not judge others, number 11. Do not judge others. Number 12, do not condemn others. This one's interesting. 13, always do more for others than they ask. Always do more for others than they ask. Going back to the lawn, I don't know why, I guess because spring, we're about to start cutting the grass again. But if you cut their grass and they ask you to, go ahead and trim, right? Trim and bag it up, whatever it takes. Do more than they asked. They asked you to go a mile, go two. Do more. Number 14, forgive one another. Man, in the church, we got to forgive each other, right? Forgive one another. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm less perfect than I think I am. You guys, I hate to tell you, are less perfect than you think you are. None of us are perfect. Forgive each other. And I've also found that none of us translate the other person's intent perfectly. Like, I may assume you meant the worst when you really didn't even know. And you may assume that this was intentional and I didn't even think of you, right? Never, never do that. Forgive each other. 15, which I think we're at, we'll just call it 15. Be merciful. Be merciful. 16, I like it. If someone upsets you, go talk to them. Just go talk to them. And if they still don't understand or they still hold firm on it, then get someone to go with you who agrees with you that this probably was wrong and go talk to them. Number 17 is the other side of that same coin. If you know you upset someone, guess what, church? Go talk to them, right? Go talk to them and make it right. Number 18, if you say yes, let it be yes. If you say no, let it be no. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, which I like to say means say what you will do and do what you say. That's it. Number 19, give to anyone who asks. If they ask of you and you got it, honor Jesus, give to them. Give to anyone who asks. Number 20, teach new disciples how to do these things. So going back to our question, what shall I do with Jesus the Messiah? What should you do with Jesus the Messiah? 
declare him Lord of Lords, King of Kings of your life, then follow his commands. As Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we just went through what they were. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you for Jesus who is showing us the way as he declares, I am the way. And the truth that he gives us and the life that he freely gives for us. God, may we become better followers, stronger followers, more dynamic leaders of, of those who don't know you and those who are beginning to know you. God, make us disciple makers. Make us your ambassadors who can't wait to tell the next person of the goodness of who you are. And make us the kind of people who so love each other that those around us are just talking about it. What is with these Christians? Why do they care so much for each other? It's because of who you are. Jesus, thank you for being the standard, the leader, the Savior of all mankind. We love you and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We cannot wait to see you Sunday. We'll see you. I don't think we're having Wednesday, but we will see you Sunday. And then the next Sunday, we hope to see you at our big event at the Saturday. I'm sorry, Saturday the 23rd. It's at 10 a.m., right? Nine. Okay. All right. Well, so luckily I have a card.